Hi, um, welcome to uh, the next chapter of uh, PSF Deploy Toolkit. Uh, I'm Dan Cunningham. We've got Dan Goff and Mitch Richters. Uh, so, just firstly, uh, thanks for our sponsors uh, Chocolatey, Patch My PC, which we're from, um, some Paris, and Scriptrunner. So, just uh, a little bit about me uh, I'm one of the co founders of PSIDT and one of the developers. Uh, I've got about 25 years experience in endpoint management and security. Uh, yeah, Zenworks is way better than SMSV2. Uh, I'm around that long. Hi, I'm Dan Goff. Um, I work with the, the application catalog team at Patch My PC and do a lot of PowerShell scripting whenever I can see an excuse to write a script and solve a problem. I just dive in there. Um, spent many years before that being an application packager or a text file engineer, which is a job description that Ben told me about the other day. Been a long-term PSADT user, stroke abuser. Um, say that because I have been using it to do things that it wasn't designed to do, which has now caused us a problem when we're having to try and support those use cases when we change things in future. Um, yeah, now on to Mitch. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so my, my name is Mitch. I'm a long-term consultant um, in MSPs within Australia, and my current specialty is focusing on modern workplace. I do a lot of insurance. I also do Jamf and uh, VMware Workspace one as well. I've been working with PowerShell for about 10 years now in a professional capacity. Um, before that, just doing what everyone probably did with one-liners to get mailboxes out of exchange servers and things like that. And um, I love Vegemite very, very much. And um, if you can see toast under the Vegemite, there's not quite enough on there. <laughs> All right, so uh, first off, uh, who here has used uh, PSADT in the past? Okay, so we got a good portion of, of people here. That's good. Because uh, a lot of the focus about this, uh, this talk is about our, our next release. Uh, but just to kind of uh, recap for everyone and, and for people who don't actually know, what is PSADT? Uh, well, it's an open source partial framework for creating application deployment scripts. Uh, it consists of a standardized workflow for application installs, uninstalls, and repairs. And typically, it will be used to encapsulate a pre existing vendor install, so an MSI or an executable. Uh, and then it can be used to add steps to the install process, so a pre install, a post install. Uh, enhance the capabilities of the vendor MSI, um, and most importantly, I guess, is to standardize the process of deploying and supporting applications. So, uh, you know, uh, better logging, um, a better standardized UI uh, for every application. And as well as that, it provides a set of easy to use functions for uh, simplifying deployment tasks. So, things like edit registry, uh, you know, a copy file, things like that. Uh, so, as well as that, it also integrates into many third-party tools. Uh, Scatman being one, it's part of the Patch My PC family of products. Uh, Master Packager, uh, who are very good friends of ours. Uh, Flexair Admin Studio, Install Shield, uh, Rain Packet Studio, uh, Rain, sorry, Rain Studio, uh, Pay Suite, Windows Client Management, to name but a few. There's, there's actually a ton of other tools that it integr integrates with. And the typical use cases you would see that, uh, that it's used for would be validating prerequisites uh, for, uh, let's say, if you had, uh, you had to have VC runtimes installed before an application um, gets installed, or maybe .NET Framework, um, uninstalling existing applications and maybe performing any sort of cleanup operations if you're doing a, a version upgrade. Uh, if you're doing a, maybe a product swap, uh, you might be capturing important settings uh, that could be required for a migration from one app to another. Uh, and then running post-install configuration tasks, so cleaning up desktop shortcuts, making registry modifications, editing XML files, anything like that. Uh, user experience is one of the big things that we provide and uh, things that people like the most. Uh, so um, allowing to be actual, uh, allowing to defer, uh, defer an application install, so maybe uh, uh, providing the number of times that you can actually uh, do that, uh, maybe the number, of, or the number of days or a specific date, so setting a deadline. Uh, the other thing that we're, that's very useful is being able to close in-use applications. So when you, uh, where if they're not uh, closed, you might need a reboot or it might have locked the file in some way. Uh, for the actual, um, for the install, uninstall, or repair, uh, there's other tasks like being able to block an application execution. So when you close an app from, run, uh, from um, when you close an application, you will then also maybe want to be able to prevent it from being open during the install. So something like Word, Excel, PowerPoint. Uh, being able to display some sort of progress message. Um, so while the install is running, having an install in progress. Or maybe you want to display a custom progress message of some sort while you're doing a pre-install cleanup. And uh, for the actual uh, 
finalization or cleanup, uh, having some sort of balloon tip uh, that pops up at the, oop, a balloon tip that pops up at the end of the install and also at the start. Um, having some sort of restart prompt uh, where uh, we can have a timer. And also preventing that timer from, or preventing that uh, dialogue from being dismissed. So after a certain period of time, you could basically force that dialogue to stay on screen and not be uh, removable. Maybe the last minute of the, of the, uh, of the action. So what are our goals for version four? Well, one of the first things we want to be able to do is enable Patch My PC to be able to provide commercial support for deployment scripts. This is, um, this is something that we're working towards right now, uh, but it's, uh, a couple of, it's a little while away. But in order to be able to do that, we're going to need to be able to do a couple of things. So firstly, we need to be at a minimum level of supported Microsoft products. So the likes of you know, ensuring that we're on Windows PowerShell 5.1 because Microsoft supports that. Um, in version three right now, we support you know, pretty much any, every version from PowerShell 3 and above, but that's no longer supported by Microsoft. So when I say support, we, you know, uh, best effort support. For commercial support, we want to be able to provide something that's a little bit more, a um, uh, little bit more backed. So when we provide support, we want to rely on Microsoft to be able to provide, uh, provide underlying support for the stack. So um, Windows 10 LT, uh, LTSB is going to be our minimum requirement. .NET Framework 4.6.2, uh, Windows 5, PowerShell 5.1, and we will also support uh, PowerShell 7.4 as well. Uh, we also want to be able to ditch a lot of the legacy code that's been keeping us back. Uh, we have a lot of functions in there that are, uh, we'll say, hacky in order to support older versions of PowerShell or older versions of Windows, and we're ripping that all out. In the Sorry? Uh, yes, VBS is essentially going to be ripped out as well. Uh, so uh, one of the main things we want to keep in this, though, is full backwards compatibility with the V3 script. So we're changing an awful lot. We're making all these new requirements. But uh, we do want to be able to keep backwards compatibility uh, with V3. And so far, we've been able to achieve that. We also want to have a modernized design and be consistent with Windows uh, WinUI 3 or Windows 11 look and feel. We also want to be able to prevent a poor user experience. And so uh, one of the things that we've noticed is with V3, we have a lot of very ugly banners that are being created by IT people out there uh, you know, who, who don't necessarily have any kind of design skills. But you know, they might have the company logo and then some horrible colors. We want a way of being able to save people from that and still have a, 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 like a very uh, clearly a co corporate branded UI if they want, but still look pretty. And one of the other things that we were looking to do was start uh, adding in long-term, uh, long-standing user requests. Uh, so Wim image support is one of the first things that we're looking at there. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Mitch, who's going to talk us through a little bit more about the, the V4 architecture. Nice, Phil. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, just before I get started, I just wanted to thank Patch My PC again. I'm actually not an employee of Patch My PC. I'm just a community member, but um, they've sponsored me to be here to talk today. So I'm really happy for that. And um, it's been a fantastic trip so far and also my first time in Europe. So I'm really appreciative. Um, so let's talk about the current state of V3, just so we can understand where we're at to understand what we need to do to get to our end target. So the current state of V3, uh, we have our user configured script, which is your deploy application.ps1, and it's dot sourcing a backend library, that is the app deployed toolkit main. This script, it's basically a monolithic script full of functional code and procedural code. I think the line count is about 17,000. It's nothing short of monstrosity, and it's just something that we need to look at. The procedural code, it does a number of things as well. So it generates a lot of variables that it puts into the script scope. So you've got all your environment variables, you've got other variables that you can use to build your scripts. That's really cool, but it also is quite difficult to adapt something like that into a module. Um, some of the functions as well, and you know, this is just things that have come from past times. Some of the verbing is not correct. We've all seen execute dash process and other things like that. These are things we want to fix. We also want to address things like um, parameters which are using booleans instead of switches and other things, just to get things working in a more PowerShell standard way so that when you're using the toolkit, you're, you're learning PowerShell, you're not learning how the toolkit works in its specific manners. 
Um, the other thing as well with those variables, nothing in the dot source script is ultimately private. If it's generating a variable to use temporarily to generate another variable, that variable is then available because it's all within the one session state. So um, with that in mind, it makes refactoring the code a lot harder because a lot of the internals are exposed to people and they can do all kinds of different things with them. So what's next? What is next is we want this to be a PowerShell module and we're going to talk about what we need to do to get there. So first things first, to convert into a module, we take all of the procedural code which is in app deploy toolkit main. So this is all the logging output you see before it actually starts doing what you tell it to do. All of that stuff has been converted into a class object. The idea behind having a class object is that all of that logic is contained within an object and it doesn't live within the scope of the script or the module itself. This also enables other things in the future like multiple sequential sessions where you could basically have a deployment package, it's one single script, and it could have five different sessions that sequentially run. One could be for Visual Studio runtimes, one could be for your application, one could be for something else that depends on that. And you can build that solution out as a single script, but it ultimately and logically acts like five individual scripts, all with their own individual logging. This is the benefit of using class objects that we can switch between sessions at will. Uh, the remainder of the code, we're going to convert that into a module. And the legacy dot source script, so the um, app deploy toolkit main script, that is going to serve as a compatibility layer between the module and what you're doing currently. So the idea behind that is if you're calling execute process with whatever parameters you give it, the wrapper in main will translate that into the new function, the correct verb, and that will allow you to take your existing code, run it against a, a dot four backend, a v4 backend, and continue to operate as you have been. Um, the variables. So getting the variables out of the module and into the caller state, the way we do that is when you open a new session, which is all done for you in App Deploy Toolkit main, we're passing through a session state object within your current execution context. When we have that information that gets provided through, that means we can actually take variables that we generate in the module and bring that back into the caller state. That means that all of the variables you're using, which might be something like ENV, common desktop, or whatever variables that PS app deploy toolkit generates, you can just keep using those and they exist and keep working fine. Um, and lastly, the functions are being rewritten to use the correct verbs and parameter types. So we are getting rid of Boolean parameters for switches. We are using the correct verbs for everything. Um, and we're also taking the opportunity to prefix all of the commandlets with ADT. So execute process, for instance, would now be start ADT process. And the reason we're doing that as well is we've had instances where there's collisions in the past. As you can imagine, a function like write log is quite generic and there's lots of modules out there that use that. And we've seen instances where you get clobbering between what you're trying to do with PSADT versus a module that you might already have installed in the system. And it can just lead to a few situations. Uh, this is the current module architecture as it stands right now. So the way that works is we have a manifest module called PS App Deploy Toolkit. It has no script, it has no real logic in it, but what it serves is, is the umbrella to import a number of other modules into your session for the purpose of running a PS ADT operation. We break those modules down into three different sub-modules that get called in. We have PS App Deploy Toolkit .core, which is everything needed to do the logging, start a session, close a session, and just run the, uh, the actual toolkit itself. Uh, common is all of the utility code that you probably use within your script today. So that might be to do uh, file transfers, that might be to do um, you know, registry changes for all users or active setup. All of that logic lives within common. And lastly, we have dialogues as well. So the dialogue code is completely segregated out into its own module. And what that allows people to do as well is if you wanted to happen to change or replace the dialogue code with your own because you need something that really needs to meet something specific to your business, you can do that and you're not basically forking off the entire toolkit, you can just change that dialogue code as required. Um, what this is also going to allow, as you can probably see, we're now using three different modules here. We imagine and envisage that people will expand upon this and do their own modules to expand out PS App Deploy Toolkit. So rather than having an extensions file like you might have been using in the past, which itself gets dot sourced in, you could write PS App Deploy Toolkit dot Winget or PS App Deploy Toolkit dot something else. You can write that code and have it be its own separate module that integrates with the project but remains ultimately separated and standard. That could be a module that you then publish as an open source module, or that could be something that's proprietary to your business, and that's entirely up to you. But uh, we foresee that this structure is going to allow a lot of expansion in the future and uh, ultimately make the toolkit very approachable for new users and also for expansion. 
Uh, some of the other changes, just to go through things. So strict mode is enabled within all of our modules at the level of three. That is the highest level that you can enable to date. Um, so strict mode takes away a lot of the undefined behavior in PowerShell. You know, it's really important in our opinion to know that if you're accessing a variable and it's null, is it null because it's meant to be null or is it null because something has gone wrong? We want to allow, make sure that all accesses to variables are done correctly so that if we do have an unexpected access to a variable that is null, it can throw an error so we can identify what's going wrong there. It just enables you to have a lot more trust within the module because it's doing a lot more validations than it was in the past. Um, we're moving a lot of the config and language stuff from XML into PSD1 format. So PSD1 is a PowerShell uh, native definition file and the idea behind that is when you in merge in a PSD1 to use for languages, it actually uses your PSUI culture. It allows automatic language selection. It takes away a lot of procedural code to importing the dialogue because we're using the language better to do more things. And this was something that wasn't really quite possible when we're trying to support older versions of PowerShell, but now that we're baselining things on PowerShell 5.1 and 7, it's a lot more approachable. Uh, all of our functions are being rewritten to be standards compliant, so we, we don't want to have things like invalid verbs. We don't want to have parameters that are using booleans instead of switches. We also don't want to have things like, you know, uh, the continue on error parameter. You should be able to use error action like you would on any commandlet within PowerShell and get an expected behavior, and that's what we're trying to go for, so that the toolkit is like you would expect for any other PowerShell commandlet that you would run. Um, and the lastly as well, um, we are using custom return types for our objects, not just PS custom objects. So if we have a function which is returning an object with three different properties, we don't just want to return a PS custom object because it doesn't have a defined signature, it's just a generated type on the fly. We type those, um, you know, strongly by using classes and structures to do that, and that way you've got an actual object which is guaranteed. So if you're taking a, a return data from one function to give it to another, because that object is typed, it means that you can't possibly pass the wrong data to a, a function as another parameter, and that just further enhances the reliability of the toolkit. Uh, and the last one, uh, we are looking at digitally signing the entire module, including all of the C Sharp files. There's a lot of logistics there in terms of doing that securely with an HSM, and there's a lot of uh, requirements around that. We are still looking into it, but our ultimate goal and vision is to digitally sign it if we possibly can. Please. How can you extend the uh, deploy toolkit module then uh, when you're digitally signing it? Well, what would happen there is our toolkit that we ship would be digitally signed, and then if you do your own module, you don't necessarily need to digitally sign your own module if you don't want to. You can import that module by running execution policy bypass or something like that. But to guarantee a level of trust from our perspective at the baseline, the code that we ship as a release, we would like to have digitally signed. So just to go back on one level here, um, the way that, and I will show the code on how this imports, the PS App Deploy Toolkit manifest, even though I'm showing that it requires certain modules, it's requiring those modules at the global state. They're not getting imported in the PSD1 as nested modules. So you shouldn't have to modify the toolkit. Effectively, PS App Deploy Toolkit is just serving as a means to import these three modules without you having to import all three modules yourself. No worries. So I will now start looking at the code. So this is a new deploy application script, and at the moment we're calling that invoke ADT app operation. Again, trying to get the verbing right, deploy is not a valid verb. So starting from the very top, we have the same sort of parameters that you're used to, where you've got deployment type and deploy mode, and the familiar switches like allow, reboot, pass through, etc. The variables um, are slightly different, but same, same. So we can see here we're opening a hash table called ADT session, and within there we've still got our familiar ver variable names like app vendor, app name, app version. You would configure this in the exact same way that you would configure uh, an existing script so far. Again, though, it is important to state that for new deployments, this is what you would be doing. We're aiming it so that if you are taking a legacy deployment and you are putting it against version four, that legacy deploy script will continue to work without any change. Moving forward, uh, you have three different functions here, install ADT application, uninstall ADT application, and repair ADT application. These functions are your blocks where you would define what you're doing with your script. So if I just expand this collapsed one out, we can see it's quite familiar in terms of what a deploy application script is doing at the moment. We can see that we're setting an install phase, we're showing our welcome screen, we've got our progress window that comes up. 
the same stuff here around uh, use default MSI and other bits and pieces, and then we move into the post-install phase. So logically, it works the same way as before. It's just slightly cleaned up and slightly different syntax. And then moving down, once we get to about line 290, this is where the main action starts. So we, we set some error action preferences. We want to try and stop on all errors so we can catch things more properly. We also set a level of strict version in the uh, front-end script, but we only set that at version 1. Version 3 does a lot of things which a number of people consider unacceptable when it comes to accessing variables that aren't properly defined. Um, it's important to us that we have the code in its toughest position possible on the module, but it doesn't mean we need to enforce that for the user. So we're enforcing a version one. It is ultimately there, but you know you can take it out and that's perfectly fine. But out of the box, we would like to ship it with a version one. Please. Does that come through also uh, the What's it, sorry? Yeah, you can, so you can deploy packages in the system context just as you have been before. Um, are, you, are you doing something like with service UI to bring applications up, or you mean with just SCCM where you tick the box and make it available to show to the user? Um, yeah, so anything you've been doing before will definitely still work. So if you have been um, doing interactive installs with system or just any install with system, that's of course fully supported. Um, that's a very important part of the toolkit for Intune and SCCM, so all of that will still work. Um, moving on, we basically import our module, we then initialize the module. So initializing the module in this sense is going to generate the environment variables that uh, you would use, so ENV, common desktop, ENV, whatever we generate, and it puts them into your session. We then open a new ADT session and we pass through a few parameters and we basically redefine ADT session to be the generated ADT session object. Once that's done, all the deployment is basically invoking the function, which is either going to be install ADT app operation, uh, repair ADT application, or um, uninstall ADT app application. And then once that's done, it closes out the session. So the workflow is ultimately very much the same as it was before. You don't have to worry about any of that. You just customize these three functions to do your requirements, which is installing an app or uninstalling an app or repairing an app, and you get the same experience. And again, um, if you are using a legacy script, they do continue to work. Moving on from there, if we go and have a look at app deploy toolkit main now, so this is our main file where historically this has been about 17,000 lines of code. This is basically what it looks like now. It is setting some of the error action preferences again, it is importing the module, and it is opening a session. This file is not used by the new wrapper, it is only used when you're using a deploy application legacy script. All this file has in it now are the wrappers. So the wrappers are things like write log. This is ultimately boiling down to just changing the call to write ADT log entry. And it basically takes the same parameters, adapts them, and places them on the end of that. If we go down to another function, exit script, it no longer exists, of course it's called close ADT session. It's basically taking that code, advising you that it's been deprecated, and completing the action. So. This is how we get around issues where we have functions that even no longer exist or the signature on the function has changed so drastically. By wrapping the functions like this, you get the ability to um, completely maintain that backwards compatibility, something you can't do with an alias alone. Um, moving on to the module structure itself. So if we have a look in the app deploy toolkit folder, we have PS app deploy toolkit and under modules, we have three different modules here. If we go and have a look at how that's imported, this is our manifest for the module, and just um, on the back of what we were talking about with the gentleman before, we can see here that right now it is requiring three modules, but they are not nested. So these modules get imported into the global state, um, just as any module that you import yourself will. So the idea behind that is they get imported as first class citizens, and then if you want to do extension modules, even if they're not signed, they will still be in the global state as well, and that will all work fine. It's just at that point, if your own module is not digitally signed, you would have to bypass the execution policy to ensure that import works as expected. But you don't need to modify the toolkit in any way, shape, or form to extend the toolkit. Uh, you can just write your own modules and import them. Uh, moving on to the other module structures, um, and I'll just use Core as an example. The way these are broken down is they have their own PSD1, as you would expect, and these are actual script modules with a PSM1 that do all of the importing, and then things are broken down into public, private and class objects. So private functions are just functions that are used within the module, they don't go anywhere. Classes are also data types and structures to support the module, 
and the public files are the functions that get exported. Uh, these are defined as one function per file, and they all get dot sourced into the main PSM1 to compile the module before you import it. Uh, from here, what I would like to do is I would like to hand over to Dan Goff. He is going to run through the process of demonstrating a new deployment using WinSCP. Thank you. <coughs> sure. So this is deploy application PS1 from a version three PS82 script, something you may be more familiar with. At the top, you have your, ver your variables de declared. Scroll further down. I've got a mouse here, why am I doing the touchpad? There we go, so we are in ex running execute MSI, remove file for a, removing a desktop shortcut, and setting some HKCU registry keys for all users on the, on the device. These are now, trans these will just work as is, with the, the new V4 toolkit. So the, one of the first things that your regular deploy application PS1 script does is it will dot source toolkit main. Previously that toolkit main had all of the functions within it, now it has all the wrappers and it instantiates the module and sets up the session. And everything just passes through and it should just work exactly as it did before. But we can show some of the differences in the syntax we go back to the install section. Execute MSI in version three. Here is the new script, invoke ADT operation. And it starts ADT MSI process. The rest of the parameters are exactly the same in this instance. In some others, they will be different. You may be familiar with the fact that a lot of the functions in v3 had a, a boolean parameter such as continue on error true or false and you had no real idea if the default was true or false without delving into the code or the docs because in one function it was defaulting to true and in the other one it was defaulting to false um, so to remove that ambiguity the there is now a switch so if there is a switch that exists called continue on error you can therefore infer that by default it will not continue on error and we've used that process throughout, so all booleans are now switches, and just by the name alone, you can infer what the default behavior would be if you weren't to use it. Moving further down, uh, remove file is now remove ADT file. Invoke HKC registry settings for all users is now invoke ADT all users registry change. Slight difference in the syntax with V4 this time. In compatibility mode, we still support using the old method. You had to have this dollar user profile dot SID to tell the set registry command which user to apply the change to. In the new world, the syntax is now just dollar underscore because there is a for each object piping through to this script block. And then you've got show installation prompts and everything else, all working pretty much similar as before, just with a new command name. So we'll also get a chance to show off the fact that this is running in PowerShell 7, PWSH at the command line here. Uh, this is going to um, pop up and ask me to close the old version of WinSCP that I have here. And note that the UI has changed, but we haven't got around to updating all of the dialogues yet, so you'll see a bit of a mix of old and new, but you'll still get a flavor of what it's gonna look like. So this is the old UI. Um, my OS is in dark mode, but the old toolkit is in light mode. So we're gonna close this app. And now the, here's the new style UI, all running in dark mode and it respects the user's preference. Mm -hmm. And also the user's chosen accent color, which in this case is orange. 
the orange blow on the taskbar too, it all matches that. So before when you had a banner that you could customize per your, uh, for each company, you now just have a square icon. I'll just bring it up again just so you can see it. It'll run very quickly because it's, it's installed. But that icon there, let's uninstall it. So you just get to replace this square icon now. And there we go. That's just a quick demo of what it's going to look like. We do intend to have some tools to help the, pro the, the transition to translate your V3 scripts to V4. That's all that's to come in future. But um, any questions before we move on to the prize draw that we'll do at the end? Yeah. Yes? That's right. Um, we, we do have reboot countdowns, reboot prompts that you can customize in many ways. It detects when a PowerPoint presentation mode is running, so it, it, you can prevent the whole installation from popping up. We don't have anything to detect when the user is in a Teams meeting yet, but we do have, want to put something in there in the future. So that's. So we're, we will keep the um, defer isn't going away. That's, that's staying as an option. Um, there is going to be an, some additional uh, functionality around, uh, like right now we're able to detect if you've got a PowerPoint presentation open. We're hoping to be able to add in detection for across the, ball, uh, across the board any sort of uh, meeting, particularly if you're presenting during a meeting. So um, if you've got your webcam on uh, or if you're uh, presenting something, sharing your screen, and that should work across Zoom, Teams, uh, WebEx, uh, and pretty much anything else. But we're reliant on an OS hook for that. Don't know for sure just yet. We're just kind of like investigating it. But uh, at the very least, we should be able to detect whether you've got Teams open and you're in a meeting, uh, as well as pot potentially um, other other apps as well. But Zoom is, or sorry, Teams is definitely one that we're going to look for initially uh, support out of the box. Okay. Thank you. Ben. Do you not know? <laughs> okay, we'll look into that. So, as far as I know, there is a there is basically OS hooks to since version of um, since Windows 10, isn't it? Or Something like that. There is there is something that you can grab to try and work out if the device is presenting or in focus mode, but I don't know how, uh, if Windows just makes a determination on that or whether the vendor has to be nice and advertise that they're doing this as well. And we all know what vendors can be like at times, so. Yeah, there's, I mean, Teams is particularly problematic because they either advertise it to the OS uh, or I know that there's an API you could use, like a local desktop API with Teams V1 and V2. The problem with that is you need an API key in order to access it and it's done through a REST, um, uh, REST connection. So it's like you need to somehow figure out what the API key is and then, or, uh, then basically ma make the call to figure out whether you're presenting or not. It's a little bit messy. I, there's got to be a better way though. Yeah, because you both need to access it. Correct, yeah. That's true. We were actually hoping to have a preview out today for everyone here, uh, but we're a little bit behind on that. So what we're hoping for is to hopefully have a preview release uh, or a final release by MMS, uh, which is October 23rd, 24th, because uh, that would be pretty much a year to date when we announced a partnership with Patchwork VC, so it would be really nice to be able to uh, have it launched at that. That's what we're working towards anyway. If we are going to hit that date, though, we are going to have a preview release out sooner. So I would say expect a preview release within the next six to eight weeks. OK, well, if there's no more. It's worth just noting as well just on the that we have made com uh, compatibility with 
the V3 uh, deployment scripts as like the main priority. Uh, so when you basically move over to using V4, you should be able to customize your logo. So basically pr throw in a new logo, uh, potentially fall back on the old dialogues if you want to keep the banner, if you want to keep the look and feel of what's there. Um, but if you want to move to the new, uh, the new newness or the, the new hotness, then uh, being able to just swap out the logo, configure a couple of settings in your, your new PSD one, which would have been the XML file, and then your existing scripts should stay the exact same. So you'll just be literally replacing the app deploy toolkit main folder in a deployment. Now, in an environment where you already have things being deployed out, I mean, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If it's an old, like an older release, but if you're release or deploying out a new version of a product, so let's say Adobe Reader comes out with a new version, at that point, that would be a good time to maybe look at doing the changeover. And uh, you can keep the look and feel of all of the previous version. Your old scripts will continue to work, so you don't need to invest time in doing an upgrade of those. What we would like to see is over time, though, people start using the new format, and that allows us to be able to migrate over time. But we know that you know, there's, there's not necessarily a huge appetite for changing all your deployment scripts like day one. Uh, and so we're being very, very cognizant of that and making sure that we work for you know, a long period of time. So expect like at least a year or two uh, that we'll keep working with uh, V3 scripts.